Hello and welcome to this Google Hangout, which is part of the Literature over the English Country House massive open online course, a MOOC broadcast from the University of Sheffield over on the MOOC. We're in week three um, and we're going to answer your questions tonight live on this platform. Um, if you're watching on Google Hangout, you can pose questions by selecting the Q&A tab that should be visible on your screen. It might even be the case that the panel's already appeared. Um, but click Q&A and ask your questions and we'll answer as many as we can. You can also ask questions on Twitter using the hashtag FLHouseLit. I'm Adam Smith. I'm Susan Fitzmaurice. Um, and we're actually joining you today from 285 Glossop Road, which I think is a, uh, it's the first time we've ever done this on the it's MOOC. It is, it's definitely a first. We are broadcasting direct from MOOC HQ. So actually, this it's is... Actually, it's the MOOC Museum. <laughs> the MOOC Museum. <laughs> the background. MOOC Museum. Um, yeah. So all of the people who actually make the MOOC work are based here and you may see them in the background behind me is Laura Giles um, and in the cupboard is Rob our cameraman <laughs> um, so I thought we could just start by saying a little bit about how we came to be working on the 18th century and what our interests are and, and, and what we're doing on this MOOC yeah Susan, do you want okay. to start us off? sure sure well um, as you can probably guess I, I've been working um, in academia for a long time and um, I have an enduring interest in the language of 18th century England um, and I've worked on letters and on diaries, on essays, um, sharing with Adam a particular passion for Joseph Addison. And um, most recently I've been working on um, the uh, uh, long novels written by uh, Georgina Devonshire and people like her. And I'm particularly interested in the relationship between politeness and sincerity mm. in the second half of the 18th century. Um, and so that's that's essentially what I've been working on. Cool. Most um, yeah, and I so yeah, I came into the 18th century with interest in this guy Joseph Addison. Um, my PhD was about other authors as well, but it was mainly about Addison. And I was looking at newspapers and periodicals and magazines. Mm -hmm. um, and the ones, the corpus that I was looking at, they they were all funded by um, political parties, but they didn't necessarily signal their partisan allegiance. That's right. Um, so I talked a lot about another paper by Joseph Addison called The Freeholder, which was ostensibly a magazine about what how great it is to own property. It is, yeah. But it was also funded, it was sponsored by the Whig Ministry, and I sort of looked at, at the political stretch, partisan strategies it was using, and argued as well that politeness, which is something we talk mm -hmm. about a lot this week, can mm -hmm. actually be used to enact quite violent Absolutely. maneuvers right. um, and doesn't necessarily mean playing nice. And since then I've been looking at newspapers and magazines outside of London and just recently um, newspapers from Sheffield, Yes, um, which has been really exciting. It has been exciting. Well, yeah. Yeah, newspapers and politics um, have um, a natural affinity wherever they are, don't mm -hmm. they? Um, and so that, that makes it particularly interesting. Um, yeah. So um, we have like a excellent. few questions that we can possibly start with. Yeah. What do you think? So how about uh, this one, Daphne? Yeah. I think so. so Daphne says, um, I'm interested in women's contributions to the notion of politeness in the 18th century. To what extent was politeness influenced by women, given their dominant social sphere was the home? Well, and that's a really interesting question uh, because, and, and, and actually you point uh, to a key distinction. Um, women did not actually frequent coffee houses unless they were proprietors. Um, and if they happen to be the proprietor of a coffee house or a tavern or something like that, then it's very likely that that particular coffee house would not necessarily have been a hub of politeness. Mm -hmm. okay? So we have really interesting stories of women like Mole King, um, who ran a tavern, um, a, a bed and breakfast and various other things, um, which used to attract um, upper class uh, young men um, who effectively had a great deal of, of fun transgressing their class effectively because they could uh, pretend to be low life um, in, in the tavern. So what did women do? Well, they sponsored salons. They had tea parties and Addison talks about this mm -hmm. at the tea table, the great visits to the tea table um, where women would um, share um, their own uh, readings of the spectator and the tattler, mm -hmm. um, as well as the newsprints, because uh, they got the newsprints. Mm -hmm. um, so w women influenced the, if you like, the uh, the ambiance and the manners um, that they that were, were really practiced mm -hmm. in the domestic sphere. What's interesting is that men participated in these domestic salons mm -hmm. um, and these gatherings. Um, whereas women did not participate, uh, for the most part, in, in, in these gatherings in coffee houses. Mm. So outside of the home, 
and um, not including the coffee houses, where, where assembly, were, assembly rooms, assembly so rooms and yeah. pleasure gardens. Yeah. Right. So there were big public spaces um, where men and women would mix um, and promenade, take tea, mm -hmm. um, show off their finery. Mm -hmm. uh, the opera is another place. Mm -hmm. Um, and the theatre. Mm -hmm. So all of these areas, um, as today, you know, public gatherings where you could uh, be seen and and see others mm -hmm. um, and and interact. And that that was the the context for the easy kind of interaction um, that is that early 18th century politeness really typifies. Mm -hmm. Later on, in the second half of the 18th century, mm -hmm. of course, these places become associated with aristocratic vice. Mm -hmm. um, and electioneering and yeah. things like that. Yeah. But yeah, there are there are public spaces um, that really do become um, um, places where both women and men um, can can interact very very comfortably. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point about uh, what you when you talk about Mole King's Tavern and the idea that you have these codes of politeness, and then mm. as soon as you have them. There's the desire to transgress them exactly, as well, yeah. and that's you know I spent a lot of time looking at the early 18th century and early 18th century satire, and that that binary really characterises a lot of the literature. So in the day everyone is polite, yeah, and everyone is behaving by the codes of conduct, and then at night you get the libertines and the revellers, and then loads of anxieties about if we've got a 24-hour consumer society and some people aren't going to bed, what are they doing? They do exactly, um, yeah. So that's a really interesting point. I think. Well, I think one of the things that increasingly um, strikes me about 18th century and 18th century politeness, and this is why I wanted to look at sincerity, mm. is that people thought that you couldn't be polite mm -hmm. if you were being sincere. Mm -hmm. be because to be sincere is to, is to, uh, is to be absolutely genuine, mm -hmm. and to be honest. Uh, it changes kind of later on. But certainly, um, I think that we can get rather interesting um, mm. interpretations of, um, Politeness, whether it is be, whether it is real mm -hmm. and sincere, or whether it's simply a show. Yeah. And so that's where we, we start to get the transgression. That's where we start to to, to find satire mm -hmm. on politeness. So when Swift talks about a polite conversation, he's satirizing it. He's mocking it. Mm -hmm. He's saying that you're being polite so that you can simply be on show. Yeah. yeah. This has no basis in reality. Yeah. Which is a kind of an interesting. Yeah. Kind of and, and those problems there that you describe in, in terms of politeness, like can politeness ever be sincere? Is it mm. always a show? I mean, mm. this is something that we see as a lot when we look at letters as well, isn't it? Absolutely. So, I mean, a lot of this week on the course, people have been discussing letter writing. Yeah. And that's that the tension. Like, if you respect someone, is that reflected in your adhering to certain codes and ways of presenting yourself or the transgression of them? That's so, right. if I'm really close to you, I'm not going to bother about grammar yeah exactly and, you're yeah. not going to bother about grammar you're not going to say um you are my dearest my dearest friend you yeah there's no need to yeah. say you are my dearest friend because you already know that yeah it's you're only going to say um my dear sir yeah um i have the highest regard for you of any sentence yeah if it's palpably untrue yeah okay so there's all there's all there, there, Many times, I think uh, we see, in, 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 particularly in the letters in this period, a performance yeah. of politeness, a performance of consideration for the other, where the writer isn't necessarily um, claiming, mm -hmm. really, um, that that there is any necessary truth. So everybody kind of colludes in this performance yeah. of sincerity to make sure that things go smoothly. Yeah. Yeah, and each gets what usually he wants. Yeah, and that's that's a distinction that I think the epistolary novel, which we're starting to talk about this week, yes. and we'll talk more about next week, is, is really interested in um, the idea that depending on who you write a letter, you present a different self. And yes. I guess that that maps into politeness as well. Oh, it does. So yeah. um, we were just talking earlier this afternoon about Francis Burney and Evelina, and a lot of the humour there is the disjunction between when she's writing to a guardian and when she's writing to. Uh, suitor or, or one of her friends. Exactly. And that's something that Fielding was interested in. Absolutely. Up, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So there's a real connection between, I think, politeness and, and the latter stuff that we've been looking at this week. Exactly. As well. Yeah. Okay. Oh, we've got a question over here. So, and this is from Amber. Thanks, Amber. You've just mentioned assembly rooms, and I wonder if you've any thoughts on the town versus country in the representation of these assemblies in literature. Yes, my mind goes to Austin and Darcy's distaste for country assemblies. So a moment that many of our learners have been remembering this week as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think uh, 
the town versus the country and the representation of these. What would you say? Well, actually, I think that chimes really nicely with another question that we've got been, here. Yeah. Um, so another a learner has said, um, I'd be interested to know if there's any particular differences between politeness and sociability and were these trends uh, affected by different geographical locations? So, for instance, were these binaries the same in the north and the south? Mm. Um, and certainly York, for instance, is a city which has an assembly room. Mm. And looking at the print culture in York, it certainly, certainly sees itself as replicating yeah. or, or actually reflecting what's happening in London. So, that, so the people in York... That's an in Bath, right? So and in Bath, is, yeah. you know, yeah. Yeah, so they, they are. I mean, what's interesting, and I, I'm thinking a bit about Addison too, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. who, when he's reflecting on um, the country gentry, comments um, and reflects on the fact that they appear to be aping mm -hmm. um, their counterparts in town. And so, yeah, it's quite possible that, that the assemblies as performed in the country, um, and by country really, it's not gonna be country, it's gonna be large market towns outside England. Mm -hmm. I mean, outside London, sorry. Um, they're really going to, they're simply not going to be as you know, sort of up, to, up to the minute and in fashion, I suppose, as, um, others, but it, as far as their representation in literature is concerned, yeah. yes, I think they are considered to be somewhat not impolite, yeah. but lacking in the social graces that uh, people would expect to encounter and indeed perform in London. So There's certainly comedy to be mined from the idea that, that they're not quite up to date. I'm thinking of like The Vicar of Wakefield yes. or some of the smaller novels where... Mm -hmm. It, it's funny to read about how the country is reinterpreting these things that are in London. But then that's played both ways. It so in Evelina, yeah. she's uh, the, the protagonist of Evelina when she arrives in London is bemused by all the bizarre practices. So, that they do. Yeah, so it's works both ways. And it? in the Sylph, actually, that's what yeah. we get as well. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, really, you know, very striking that the, you know, the country girl comes to London yeah. and is um, shocked and amazed yeah. at the decadence and the cruelty. Yeah. of the, the, the people in, the, in, in, in London. So it's fish out of water comedy that can be played both ways. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's another question. Right, here's another question. So um, Magda asks the question, I'd be interested to know to what extent politeness is a political construct. Now, there's an interesting point because I think they're different. Politeness is in the, well, in the history of the early modern period, um, shows up as a philosophical um, approach mm -hmm. um, to human interaction, um, to taste, to gentility and good breeding. Um, in the work of um, Anthony Ashley Cooper, um, who's the, the third... Um, um, Shaftesbury, Shaftesbury. Yeah. the Earl of Shaftesbury, in, in his book, uh, Characteristics of Men and Manners. And that it, it is a very kind of restricted elite understanding of, of politeness. And yes, that is that has political reverberations because it is so closely associated with the aristocracy. When we get spectatorial politeness that mm. is promulgated by Addison and Steele in The Spectator, it is political, but it is... Uh, and it is um, liberal, it is Whig oriented. Mm -hmm. It has more uh, to do with trade and a kind of European outlook, mm -hmm. um, um, a, a willingness um, to accommodate um, new ideas um, with freedom to own property mm -hmm. and, and, and to be able to, to, to have some control over that. Um, and that, that then, it becomes a much more liberal sense, if you like. But politeness isn't just, it, it is a political construct, certainly, but it's also deeply cultural. It is mm -hmm. literary. Um, it permeates all aspects um, of people's lives. Um, so if you, like, if, you, if you like, it's a kind of an ethos, um, I suppose, mm. um, which is interpreted in multiple ways through the coexistence of key texts. So the characteristics of men and manners, mm -hmm. published in 1711, um, reprinted throughout the century, um, the Spectator mm -hmm. um, and Addison and Steele's other um, journals, um, they, they persist. They're reprinted and excerpted and uh, digested right up until the 20th century because they were considered to be really important um, foundational reading for schoolboys and 
young women and, 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 and this kind of thing. So you get these two understandings of politeness coexisting mm -hmm. from that time. In the second half of the century, we have the construal of politeness as manners, as form, as self-preservation and self-presentation um, through the Earl of Chesterfield's letters to his son. Mm -hmm. So those are only published in 1774. So that in the last quarter of the 18th century, you've got at least three different interpretations of politeness that are all coexisting. And one interpretation might be more prominent depending on your perspective, depending on your experience. Um, was it uh, political? Absolutely. Yeah. Did it do other things? Yes. Yes, it did. Yeah. I mean, if just just because I think that's a really great question, uh, Magda. And I, one of the things I'm interested in is how Addison uses politeness mm. in political papers, but also how he talks about using politeness in political papers. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and in that, the freeholder, which is got a Whig agenda, it's paid for by the Whig ministry. He talks uh, about politeness and its origins in rhetoric. Yeah. Um, and he talks about it as it being a kind of persuasion, mm -hmm. but that's grounded in Ciceronian principles of um, showing and telling and talking. And he talks about. Um, Summers is his kind of like yes, John idea. Summers, John yes, Summers, absolutely. Lord talks, John Summers, yeah. who's a lawyer, yeah, yeah, and he famous talks lawyer. About how Summers' use of political politics in his being, his persona, in his movements, yes. and in his language yeah. was all about uh, listening, talking, open endedness, and playfulness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and he talk, he talks about how these are these are actually really useful things to bear in mind when you're entering into. A political discussion yes. um, and in the freeholder he talks a lot about how that's not what the other papers are doing, doing yes. and he talks about how they're just like throwing muck and it's spleen and it's all like toxic politics and really negative thinking and insults and he sort of says well actually we're never going to get anywhere it's, it's actually a really interesting political problem that i think Allison finds himself in with the freeholder in that he's trying to not only preach to the converted his own wig but also speak to to passing tory readers as yes. well so the dilemma he finds himself in is how can you actually have solidarity with your own party mm. but also communicate with the other without antagonizing without, without them antagonizing and them. appearing to be yeah, yeah. opposing yeah. so and yeah. so he's, and he's constantly drawing that line as well because there, was, there were critics of the freeholder who said yes. that it, i mean steel said that yes. it was uh, it was a flute when the ministry needed a trumpet like mm. it was tea he said you shouldn't be friendly to tories you should yes. be arguing with yes. them yes um so but but i think actually he was trying to posit a different kind of politics yeah um, but that's not to say that it's not persuasive and it's not dangerous because I mean there's nothing more dangerous than talking to someone who's persuading you when you don't realize it yeah exactly but uh, but I think actually it's it's useful to think about these things now as well yeah. it well it certainly yeah. is isn't it yeah I mean when, when, if we talk about a kind of politics yeah you know there can be barbs underneath the kind of politics definitely um, mm. and, and Addison's resistance to the sort of splenetic political yes. culture around to him. be to be measured to yeah. be calm to be thoughtful, yeah. to consider the other person, yeah. and to try to be as open as possible, yeah. while being very, very sure of your ground, That's so right. that you can push the argument yeah. in the nicest way possible, yeah. but still to get to the end of it. Which, bring, which brings you to the idea that, that like, um, Jürgen Habermas's idea in the public sphere and conversation. Yes. So I think Addison's solution to all problems was to talk about it through, com through polite yeah. conversation. Yeah. Um, and yeah, just I think how different the last six months would have been Absolutely. If, we'd, uh, if we'd thought about measured conversation. <laughs> um, but, but yes, so, so that's a fantastic question. Thank you very much for that, Magda. Okay, so um, here's a, a, a good question from Chris Blackburn, acknowledging that it might be a bit early for this, um, because we've read the poems on Welbeck and to Penshurst. But when did the country house itself, rather than the people in it, re-emerge as a kind of main character in its own right in novels and you're thinking of um pemberley mandalay brideshead and mm -hmm. so on um i think that's really interesting it's a question that we can work we, out over the next three weeks <laughs> I, I i think so i think we'll find that as we go through when we start having the great country houses mm. um places like chatsworth places and some of these other places um, it may be that they then, it's, it's going to be in the late 18th century, early 19th century, really, and the 19th century particularly. Mm, yeah. Um, 
I do think this this actually brings an interesting point to focus as well, though, which is that kind of I think Addison. So bringing it back to the freeholder just for a second, Addison is addressing men of property and he's interested in men of property, but it's the men rather than the property that he's speaking to. Yes. But that said, property I think is so central to all almost all discourses in the 18th century. Yes, it is. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's kind of uh, it's involved in masculinity, patriotism. Everything comes back. To, to property, and it becomes, yeah, and I suppose it's what's interesting with the, you see, what's interesting with the country house, of course, too, is that it is a sphere of influence for men, but only part of the time. Mm -hmm. In the course of the 18th century, we begin to see that um, propertied men, particularly if they're aristocrats, begin to spend more and more time in London and less and less time at their country estates. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose we, we begin to see the development of, of the great mansions in London mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. being important, which I suppose then trains attention on country houses as the um, potential locus of all kinds of stuff from ghost stories yeah. to um family sagas yeah you know yeah um and and and, and so yes i i think that we'll be looking at that in the next few weeks yeah. to, to, to consider that there was um another question actually that i'm just thinking of but from doug caro that um that is about no no wasn't this one no it was this one yeah it was doug caro were there self-made men by the end of the 18th century and if so how were they treated by the classes and the mm. the sort of rising of the middling sort is something that addison's quite excited about yeah i think something that other writers are more anxious about so bolingbroke i think in the 1720s is more is concerned about what this means for the old guard yeah. but if, if you've got that happening throughout the 18th century and more and more people have more and more property then does the really big old house take on more significance so, so I was thinking about Oscar Wilde, which uh, has been mentioned yeah. here, and uh, the, the, the Canterville Ghost is all about nostalgia for a time when, or satirising this nostalgia for a time when you had these big houses. Mm. So, is it, so is it only when that sort of, sort of starts to disappear? Well, you see, I think that again, it's possibly, possibly, yeah. um, because a number of these houses become impossible to um, maintain. Mm. They fall into wreck and ruin and they aren't rebuilt. Um, and you have, of course, there are, I think there are, there are self-made men um, who um, marry into the aristocracy, and that's where we get an awful lot of the double-barreled names, mm -hmm. surnames. Yeah. Where, um, in order to, um, you get you get a very wealthy man who, however, takes on part of the name of his wife um, in order to make sure that they can can continue the title, for example. Um, and so we we get this um, old aristocracy marrying into the self-made. Men, something which, in fact, Addison did himself. Yeah, didn't yeah, he? yeah, absolutely. Um, and so I think we just we we do see this uh, more and more. They had earned fortunes, um, but were not aristocrats. But um, the aristocrats were never, um, you know, above um, absorbing people like this into their own mm. uh, milieu. Yeah. Just, um, a, I've just seen a question here from Michelle, which could provide a brief moment of comic relief. Oh, good. Um, it's a question for Susan. Susan, you stated in one of your videos this week yeah. that politeness is about being recognisably yeah. polite. Do you think this is still relevant today? Are we recognisably polite because we feel it's correct the correct way to behave, but it has an overtone of falseness about it, as it seemed to do in the 18th century? Yeah, and what I mean by recognisably polite is that it's a marked kind of form of behaviour. Um, this is going to be really irritating, but I'm just going to say it anyway, <laughs> is that most ordinary appropriate behavior is really politic behavior. And by that, I mean, you know, we judge our behavior according to um, our interlocutors, the people that we're talking with. When somebody is you know, being, being polite, performing politeness, mm -hmm. they're kind of going over the top. Yeah. Um, and, they, and, and, and then you start to get a little bit suspicious. You think, why is this person being so polite? Are they unable to judge the temperature of this interaction? Do they not know me? Yeah. Yeah. It's, a same, it's, a, it's a sort of thing when you, you, you talk to somebody that you know really rather well, and you know that their, their wife's name is Jane, for example, yeah. but they persist in saying, um, my wife and I, 
um, believe that the best way uh, to uh, bring up children um, is to send it to boarding school, something like that. But when somebody knows yeah. that I know yeah. that his wife is called Jane, yeah. And they're talking about their children. Why would they say something like "my wife and I"? Yeah. Whereas they could simply say "Jane and I." Yeah. Think this is a good idea. Yeah. That's what I mean by being recognised. Yeah. And polite. It's yeah, being yeah. really false in a sense. It's misjudging um, the temperature mm -hmm. um, of the conversation um, with sometimes hilarious. Yeah. Um, effects and sometimes very irritating ones. Yeah. There's there's a lot of comments on the step this week about country houses. Yeah. Um, where I think people are, are actually frustrated. Uh, perceived loss of politeness. Yeah. People aren't polite anymore and want yeah. on their phone and things. Yeah. But there are, we are constantly entering into situations where there's a, a code that yes. we have to use. So, and then I mean, it, it, the code changes, it shifts yeah. according to particular circumstances. Yeah. So for somebody, politeness might be kind of over the top, mm. um, whereas for, for somebody else, um, politeness in the form of opening a door for somebody yeah. You know, offering somebody a seat, um, addressing them by a title yeah. would be expected. And usually we're looking there, different kind of norms, I suppose, and assumptions about polite behavior or politic behavior, what's appropriate yeah. given the circumstances. Um, and those, that those kind of different interpretations and obviously the different reactions then rely on somebody's age. Yeah, their social class. Yeah, you know their experience and that kind of thing. Yeah, and then yeah. there's there's comedy to be mined in literature from misjudging it, of course. Uh, which is I mean Alexander Pope's whole thing is bathos, isn't it? Yes. I brought low. So yes. if you can have decorum and then suddenly break it, and yeah. it's not appropriate. Yeah. That's 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 a gag. It's funny. I mean, I, I was looking at that step, and I've been thinking about the last few months. I've been working as a cultural engagement fellow for the university, and I've been meeting with a lot of external mm -hmm. partners. So I've had a lot of lunches and coffees and meetings, and it's interesting when I meet a new potential part potential external yeah, partner yeah. how long it is until someone mentions their personal life yes. or starts swearing oh, that's yes. usually the signal that it's going to be okay yes yes <laughs> because then they can signal that they're being comfortable that they're really comfortable yeah. with you yeah but um yes it can be quite interesting yeah. <laughs> um was georgia so this is a question from lucia raymer in which, in how, in what ways was georgiana criticized for writing herself and did she was she ever the victim of censorship I don't know that she was criticised um, herself. Um, it was certainly reviewed, and I think it was associated. It was associated with her. You've got to remember that she, it, the Sylph actually is about um, a pretty naive, innocent country girl who is seduced by this city rake, who is the epitome of vice. He gambles. He drinks. He womanizes despite having his own wife you know things like that mm. and the thing is that georgiana herself was criticized for that kind of behavior she was an inveterate gambler she lost vast amounts of money by anybody's standards okay um she had to go to the bank of england and um take out something like five loans in the course of this of something like sixty thousand pounds she lost phenomenal amounts of money she um she was a, a huge supporter um, of, of Charles James Fox in the um, 1784 election. Um, she had soirees. She um, paraded in the uh, Vauxhall Pleasure Garden. She was notorious for having the most flamboyant um, hats um, with vast feathers and you know enormous. So she was she was considered to be one of the most beautiful women in England, but you should see some of the very interesting 18th century cartoons or prints of that lampoon, her behavior. So I think the thing is this, she wasn't criticized for writing The Sylph, writing about really a situation that was the complete opposite of mm -hmm. what she was accused of, of being. She was criticized, I think, for, for I suppose, insincerity. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, so I think that that was that was it, really. Yeah, just uh, I think Georgiana is an, an interesting way into this next question from Amber, which is uh, I'd like to know more about women's literature. Was it common for women to write in the 18th century, and did they write most most of their stories as letters? Um, mm. 
there was loads, wasn't there? Lots and lots, lots of women writers a lot, a lot. in the 18th century. Um, so coming at it from a newspaper background, I immediately think of Eliza Haywood. Yes. Um, who wrote novellas, plays, and also a periodical called The Female Spectator. Yeah. Um, the Spectator's editor. Uh, was it? It's a female tattler. It's a female tattler, yeah. So 1745. Yeah. And the persona is a relation to... To Isaac, Isaac Bickerstaff, which exactly. Is the, so which these, is the... Yeah, so these papers have fictional... Fictional editors, which is kind of like an 18th century version of a house style. So yes. we all know how Isaac Bickerstaff, the fictional editor of the Tatler, is going to behave. Yeah. So then we get his sister, his cousin, think, writing yeah. a female spectator. Um, and then she, she wrote plays and novellas. There's one that we teach at the University of Sheffield on our 18th century module called Fantamina. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, my students couldn't believe it was from the 18th century. Yeah. It's absolutely extraordinary. It's about a young, young girl who goes to theatre and sees a man that she uh, quite fancies and sees how he behaves, it's about politeness again, sees how yeah. he behaves around prostitutes. Yes. And she thinks, gosh, I'd love for him to talk to me like that, but he never will because I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm aristocratic. So she decides good. to go home and come back dressed as a prostitute. A prostitute. Um, but then it escalates and she ends up back at his, well, she ends up having to hire a second house so that he can come and see her. And yes. she plans to not go all the way, yes. but then does go all the way. Yes. And then realises she's got away with it. So proceeds to, uh, but but he loses interest and goes mm. to find someone else. Mm -hmm. So she follows him around the country, taking on different persona, so that she can seduce him over and over again. Gosh. And then there's the shock at the end when he discovers that the last six women he slept with are all the same, same woman. person. Yes. Um, and and it's kind of titillating, and it's kind of didactic because it doesn't like work scandal, out well for her. It? Yeah, it's quite yeah, scandalous. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's quite exciting, mm -hmm. and my students just like, I'll leave this from the 17th. Well, it's interesting because when, when you get to Jane Austen, of course, um, and we have um, Fanny, right, mm -hmm. who is um, by, the early, by the late 18th, early 19th century, um, young women were criticized for being novel themes, mm -hmm. you know, addicted to romances and to novels. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a great deal, I mean, there's a great deal of, of, of literature written by women. Um, lots of very long novels. Some, yeah. some of, you know, like many long novels in the 18th century, written by men. Some of them yeah. are good. Some of them are not. Um, you know, if, if if you can if you can take them, that's great. <laughs> there are <laughs> lots. Put on the spot. Sir <laughs> so Charles Grandison, if you can take <laughs> it, you can take fine. it. That's fine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There are plays. Lady Mary Wortley Montague um, was um, actually a friend of, of of Richard Steele, and and, and you know somewhat of, of uh, Joseph Addison. And she wrote um, journalism, mm -hmm. she wrote plays, um, she wrote a novella, um, and and actually wrote uh, lots and lots and lots of letters. She mm -hmm. wrote some letters called Persian Letters, which were published without her knowledge, apparently, in 1725. And that was, um, there was a preface from, uh, Mary, um, no, um, Mary Astle, mm -hmm. um, who uh, wrote a great deal in, in, in the period. Um, we've got Charlotte Smith in, in the second mm -hmm. half of the 18th century, who was a novelist. Um, Elizabeth Inchbold. Elizabeth Inchbold. Yes. Uh, yeah, a Simple Story by Elizabeth Inchbold is what, one of my favourite 18th century novels, I think. Is it? Again, that's that's this, this, this kind of story of the young, a young girl who who has a, a guardian who's a religious figure, I think she's um, a figure or something. Yes. But there's a bit where the, the, the guardian figure thinks that her suitor is not, not treating her right. And there's a great line where he, when he says to like his wife, he's like, fetch my pistols. <laughs> 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 and it's just this great, exciting, dramatic moment. So yeah, recommend Elizabeth Inchbold. Oh, definitely. Excellent. Um, and then Anne Radcliffe is someone we'll be meeting next yes, week. Yes, um, On the first thing she was, there's a statistic that she was the highest paid author of the 18th of century. the 18th century, yes. Yeah, um, Mary Wollstonecraft. Yes. Um, and her rights of women. And, she went. She went on to become the mother of Mary Shelley as well. Exactly. She? So yeah. loads and loads of. And so there's Mariah Edgeworth too, mm. who wrote a, a very uh, popular novel called Belinda. Um, so yeah. if you just go in search of 18th century women's literature, I think you'll you'll find that, mm. there's, that there's a lot, uh, and much of it is vastly enjoyable. Yeah, absolutely. Um, cool. So did politeness differ according to class? So for instance, did aristocrats pay differently in the city than when they were at home? We've sort of talked a little bit about this. Talked we? a bit about uh, that. I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, well, that's a really good question. Addison deals with this to some extent in The Spectator. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's very, very social papers um, and points out that you know, aristocrats going into the, the, the countryside um, 
um, they're almost as it's as it's as though they're on vacation, mm -hmm. and they don't have to observe the same niceties as they do when when they're in town. Of course, people's routines vary quite a lot uh, because you know they, in the countryside or in, in small towns, they, they, they weren't the range of taverns or assemblies and um, um, dinners out. There wasn't Parliament. There wasn't all of these kinds of that um, you know the kind of twenty four seven. Uh, activity that there was in London and so it was much more I suppose retiring mm -hmm. um, lifestyle um, they would have house parties and dinner parties and things like that but I think it was much less pressured much easier in terms of uh, much more fluid optional activities yeah, really. yeah. there's a question here from Jessica Williams which yes. touches on or is about the idea of whether or not the 18th century's focus on self-promotion is is a new thing, mm. um, or, or or what is the connection between 18th century literature and self-promotion, which I think is a fascinating one. Mm. I mean, there's, there's certainly I've seen scholar, scholar, regularly in scholarship people refer to the 18th century as being the dawn of celebrity culture. Yeah, in many ways, which I think is quite connected to that explosion of of cheap print. And um, the authors self-fashioned a persona for themselves since they start writing, I yes. guess, I mean, you can go back to the early one period and find examples of self-fashioning. Exactly. Um, but there was a lot of it in the 18th century. Yes, I think there is. I mean, um, with sociability, I suppose the thing is, at the same time as there is a, at the same time as Addison is promoting sociability and so on, um, People are aware of the impact of the Italian courtesy books. Mm -hmm. um, they're aware of French fashion and etiquette. And um, increasingly, people are aware of the importance of speaking well mm -hmm. and speaking correctly. So at the same time, as Addison is promoting a great sociability and um, um, uh, ease of interaction so you've got uh, it, what what ends up being like the commodification of politeness and what I mean by that is that there are manuals mm -hmm. there are letter writing manuals there are grammars there are instructions for um, how to dress a table um, that, that you start to get lots of cookbooks mm -hmm. for um, for dinners and so on so so that you get this kind of exponential in increase in instruction how to present yourself mm -hmm. in the best possible way mm -hmm. okay so if you want to be seen as um, polite that as part of the gentry as um, as rising mm -hmm. um, in the world then you would do well mm -hmm. to arm yourself with a whole bunch of self-help manuals mm -hmm. go through them and practice like crazy mm -hmm. um, so self-promotion was yeah, it was pretty rampant. Yeah. And I guess if you got it wrong, oh. it was easy, easier to be ruined than it happened previously. Exactly. Um, where you've got these you new news networks. Yeah. And, yeah. I mean, that, that was I mean, something that uh, Pope, a Pope's essay on criticism mm -hmm. talks about, the idea, this, the, the idea of the mayfly poets, that you could be good one minute and then, and then, then do... gone the rest, whereas right. Spencer and Shakespeare yeah. will be with us forever because they don't have that culture. But I guess if you get in your politeness wrong or you have a yes. disastrous tea party, yeah. I think that's kind of what Margaret Cavendish is interested in those those letters we looked at last Absolutely. week, isn't it? Is that yeah. you, you can really you, there's further to fall, much further to fall if you nail your <laughs> yeah. the master. Yeah, um, there's actually a really similar uh, question on a similar theme here. Uh, could you comment on the material culture of 18th century politeness? Oh, yeah. What were the tools of the trade, so to speak? Clothes, hair, makeup, tea sets, coffee pots, and how are they used? Um, so I mean, we've got the conduct books. Yes, and we've got all the manuals and yes. things. You've got to have the right, the right tea set. Yes, you do. And actually, um, if any of, if you ever have a chance to go to the V and A, mm. um, that is the place. That, so the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, there is the most wonderful collection of and display of 18th century polite material culture that you could ever hope to see. So you can see the evolution of the dinner service, for example. Um, the number of courses, you see little plates, um, little dishes, um, many tureens, and, 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 and um, so, so, so the table dressing, mm. the teapots, the, 
coffee sets, things like that, are certainly markers um, mm. of, of polite material culture. Dress too, I mean, I think we alluded at some point um, to the fact that, you know, when women had uh, visitors, particularly well-to-do women had visitors at home, they could receive them in their bed sitting rooms mm -hmm. um, where they would they would be in their, I suppose, pajamas, but but very very posh pajamas, mm -hmm. uh, pajamas that were there um, that, that that were worn for sociable purposes. Um, I th we, we see Pope laughing and joking, mm -hmm. don't we? And Swift talking about the the processes of of, of women being dressed mm -hmm. and having visitors um, watching them get dressed. And by that, it's having their makeup done, having their. It's a bit like going to the hairdresser. Yeah, that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah. It's a highly social thing, um, but that is all part of the material, uh, you know, culture of it. Yeah, uh, for sure. Um, Jean B actually asks on that note: uh, Is there any evidence to suggest that women would go to bed in those huge hairstyles or hair pieces? Wow, <laughs> you need to read Swift. Yeah. on this, yeah. don't you? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we'll, we'll put the link in the discussion. Yes, we'll put the link in the discussion bit. because yeah. um, he kind of explodes the myth yeah. of what people do. And actually you see in some uh, 18th century portraits, uh, men without their wigs, uh, women without their curls. Yeah. Uh, but that's where you get things like um, um, you know, bed caps and things yeah. like that. Um, so you'd have protection of the beard for men, I suppose. You have yeah. protection of, of, the, of the coif uh, yeah. for, for women. Um, must have been jolly. You see, and also there's another thing is that some of these beds were very small. People mm. kind of slept sitting up and so there was little um danger i think of their depending on, <laughs> <laughs> on the style of their hair and getting it too messed up but um, yeah yeah swift was really fascinated actually oh, by a female too. performance wasn't he really he? was and, and actually some of his poems are really actually quite disturbing and grotesque. they are pretty they are pretty um, grotty actually like but the karina a young nymph goes to bed yes and she deep deep she says so she yeah she's the most beautiful prostitute I think she's obsessed with prostitutes. I mean, she's the most beautiful prostitute ever. And as the reader of the poem, we're like a voyeur in a bedroom, and she, she takes gets, out. She, yeah, she gets. Yeah, she takes off her hair and takes out her eyes and takes out her teeth. Yes, exactly. And she's and, just a. <laughs> yeah. Um, Poor skeleton. I yeah. Things. Anyway. <laughs> so, a question here about the epistolary novel. Um, why would you say it was so popular in the 18th century? Was it only because writing letters was such a frequent activity? Or is it connected to the development of literary techniques? I mean, when we look at the episodic novel, we are really looking at a, really, a very key stage in the development of the novel. We are, form, aren't we? So, yes, yes, um, yes. You see, we have we have narratives um, and, uh, but but plot certainly in the English novel. Mm. I mean, I suppose the French novel too is an epistolary novel, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so the. Um, the, it is, it is a, and, and actually when um, Joe Bray will be talking about this. Yeah, he will be. Um, and he'll be talking about Grandison and, and all kinds of things, right? Yeah. Because the, it is a very interesting thing. What we get in the epistolary novel is the ability to have different centers or points of view mm -hmm. um, from the writers of particular novels, um, of, 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 of letters, and therefore we, have represented kind of consciousness of these writers through their letters. These letters, I mean, some of these these um, novels are t tremendously long because it's, it takes a lot of letters to actually manage plot. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, once we get to Jane Austen, really, mm -hmm. I think, um, we see the, um, what she does is she is able to represent the consciousness of key characters and indeed the narrator um, without sacrificing um, plot mm -hmm. and without resorting to the, necess the necessity of having, you know, vast numbers of letters. Yeah. Um, so yes, it is, it is a stage in the evolution of the English novel. Yeah. Um, and Samuel Richardson really plays a, a key yeah. role in this. Richardson started by writing 
calendar books on how to write letters. Didn't exactly. You? So there's a connection there between there is, politeness. Yeah. Um, I think Joe, Joe Bray will talk more He's, about this. Yes, yeah, Joe, Joe talks um, about this. But yeah, he, he talks about how there was one letter in particular that was what to do if you're a young woman staying at someone else's house and the, the man of the house makes an advance upon you. Yes. And then that becomes the inspiration for, for Clarissa. For, for, I think Pamela it's and Pamela and Clarissa. And Clarissa, I guess, but they just yeah. don't yeah. end, isn't yeah. it? Spoiler. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, right. There's a question here from uh, Karen, and it was like, I thought it'd be fun during the Hangout to provide some specific examples of behavioural differences between sitting town folk during the period. Um, I, can't, I can't speak to any historical evidence, but one issue of Addison's Freeholder comes to mind. Apologies to anyone listening who knows me, because I talk about this all the time. But there's a really, issue 22 is one of the funniest things I've ever read. And it's where Mr. Freeholder, the, the imaginatively titled persona of the Freeholder, is walking in the countryside, um, having left the city for the day and he meets a fox hunter uh, who mistakes Mr. Freeholder for a Tory and starts slagging off the wigs and saying what horrible curs they are and now they're all sons of sons of whores actually a direct <laughs> quote from the paper yeah, yeah. Um, and, but instead of kicking off Mr. Freeholder decides he's going to try and persuade this guy gently mm -hmm. through conversation he ends up going back to his house where Mr. Fox Hunter produces his most prized possession, which is a bottle of punch. Yes. Good old British punch. punch yeah. and, then, and Mr. Freeholder points out to him that all of the ingredients are from different countries in Europe. And this is just after he's done a big argument about how he can't stand all these foreigners and European trade. And it just ends, the essay just ends with Mr. Freeholder saying, um, all in all, the Fox Hunter was left in some confusion. <laughs> some confusion. <laughs> sounds, so there's sounds, a kind of... Sounds familiar somehow, doesn't yeah, it? But, uh, <laughs> but, yeah. And, but, but then there is a kind of city country edge to that isn't there yeah, it's not yeah. only is he not only is mr freeholder talking to an old tory he's also the urbane gentleman out in the sticks yes so there is yes. there's, there's yes. an uncomfortableness no, i think it. there is um but it's funny. Funny. <laughs> it's funny yeah it yeah. Is good. Um, yeah yes i suppose that, that, that that's right i mean um behavioral doesn't um entertaining visitors i I think that they, uh, Fielding, mm -hmm. Fielding has a field day. It does. <laughs> um, doesn't he, in Joseph Andrews, yeah. um, um, about how um, how country folk behave, Yeah. doesn't he? Um, and so I, th there are the caricatures of country squires and um, they, they characterize the country squires as being so incredibly comfortable in their in their home environment that they have no airs or graces whatsoever yeah right and so that that kind of thing shocks um shocks people from town when they expect people to be eating right behaving rather differently at the at the table yeah uh from from them so uh yeah. follow up on joseph you know, yeah and, and then for the other for, for the other way around yeah uh, i think everyone should take from this that they should read evelina actually evelina is a good there's idea a, a really good idea there's a wonderful set piece involving a monkey uh, uh, towards the end of that book, which is great for if you're teaching it, yes. because you, if you're not sure the students have read it or not, you say, "What do you think?" They're with the monkey in the suit, <laughs> and if they think you're yanking the chain, they're not ready. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, there's some wonderful examples of both actually fish out of water in the yes. town and the country in Evelina. It's, 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 and, and, and actually, a um, subscriber for that book, someone who because it was published by subscription, its first first volume was a young Jane Austen. Ah. And yeah, and it is it is very similar to Pride and Prejudice in yes. terms of its plot. So everyone should read Evelina if you've not read it already. Absolutely. Um, see what other questions we've got coming in. Um, at what point did wealthy American women converge in England to acquire aristocratic houses? Asks Karina Gillian. Right. So um, I think this is really mid eighteenth century. Hmm. Um, and and really escalates in the in, in the second half of the period. Mm -hmm. um, there was quite a lot of traffic uh, and travel between um, England and um, and the, the, the North American colonies, particularly in this, you know, mm -hmm. really in, in the in the um, latter half of, of the century. Um, and there were increasingly uh, wealthy women. Um, who who began to, to come to to England um, for um, culture mm -hmm. um, and 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 yes so I think I think it's really I suppose the the last really is the last quarter mm -hmm. of the 18th century when this becomes rather rather more frequent mm. um, I mean, after the American Revolution after the American yeah. Revolution yeah yeah 
It's um, the, so the, the print which I've been looking at in Sheffield and York, yes. obviously, it, towards the end of the 18th century, is yes. obsessed with events in America. Yes. Um, and the figure of the, is, is it, so I've just been working on an article actually that traces the figure of the property owning gentleman through the 18th century. Yeah. And it's interesting that in Addison, when he talks about property owning gentlemen or freeholders, he talks about them as represent, as reflecting the sort of uh, status quo and yes. power structures that are in place. Yeah. Then there's sort of 1720s. Bolingbroke writes, and he talks about these community of property owning gentlemen actually have to be outside of that system, and yeah. they, have, they have to tap into a kind of essential Englishness that 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 you know that is more powerful than government yes. and can actually be opposition. And then in the 1770s, in the ones I've been looking at in York, um, they actually talk about property gentlemen having to be prepared to defend their rights at all costs. Wow. And, they, and they identify with what's happening in the colonies. Yes. Um, yes. And they sort of say, well, if those guys can get independence, we should be prepared should to be. fight for our own independence as well. Um, but they do it all through a discourse of property. Yes. And the, their justification for having a platform is that they own a, an estate. That's interesting. Um, so I suppose the thing is that the definition and importance of property also changes, mm, yeah, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah. So that you've got American heiresses who are heiresses to vast, I mean, even by those, the, you know, the, the, the standards of the day, were effectively corporations. Um, their, their, their parents made, were self-made men who made their money in trade mm. um, and in manufacturing. Um, and, and, and they are, you know, they, they are, are, are really very prevalent, particularly in the 19th century. Yeah, that's where we see. Yeah. Here's another question. This looks like a really fun one. Oh, yeah. Of late, there has been a spate of TV and films, some of them adaptations, uh, that set the scene in the 18th century. For instance, Poldark, Outlander, Bell. How do these 20th and 21st century texts represent 18th century politeness? Yeah. Um, that's a really good one. Um, I think that they kind of <laughs> yeah. do a Chesterfieldian job. Mm. I think, yeah. on politeness. So they see it as um, kind of manners, but also very much an aristocratic mm -hmm. kind of view of politeness. Mm -hmm. And they're actually looking at it for the most part, I think, um, satirically. Yeah, right? yeah. I'm thinking about the latest um, adaptation, The Lady Susan. Oh, I've not seen that yet. Oh, Love that and is Friendship. That. Love and Friendship. Yeah. Love and Friendship is absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Um, and that, I think, um, um, casts... And Jay, well, Jane Austen is never as as as, as underhand, yeah, you know, ever. Um, but I think that that, that is a nice, no, that is an interesting twenty first century um, construction of eighteenth century politeness, looking at it very much as a Chesterfieldian mm. um, self preservation, um, self advancement mm. um, kind of practice. Um, and, and, and really the idea is, well, um, when, when Lady Susan gets going, she, she can appear to be absolutely, um, uh, she can appear to be moral considerate, um, but she is totally self-interested. Mm. Um, and she, and she is beyond criticism because she can always turn an odd situation to her advantage. And so I think that, that that's kind of quite interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the examples that have been suggested here, I think are actually an, inter an interesting selection. I haven't seen Bell, so I can't speak to that. But yeah. the other two, um, Poldark, Pop, yeah. did you see Poldark? Yeah, I think yeah. Poldark is probably one of the, my favorite TV programs. It's brilliant, it's it? amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, I love the drama. Do you see the, the I suppose that, that's where you see politeness, you know, fail, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically. What gives Adrian Turner's Poldark his, what makes him so exciting to watch is that he walks into situations and doesn't obey the decorum. The norms, the decorum. So, exactly. you, and he, he's kind of, there's, a, there's a, the class element there as well, isn't there? Yes. He's kind of, he doesn't actually like the class that he's in. Yes. And he's not prepared to stand for terrible atrocities to be justified through politeness. So he will walk into a gambling scenario yes. and beat somebody up. Yes. Um, yeah, he won't let class um, get in the way. Yeah. It means then that he, this is, this is really where he can be completely sincere and genuine. Mm. Right, so what he says is what he thinks, mm -hmm. and actually, it's a hallmark of 21st century um, constructions of politeness, mm -hmm. as it is late 18th century constructions of yeah. late 18th century politeness. Yeah, that you can say one thing and mean something entirely different. Yeah, so really um, interesting. There's a there's a lot to be said about politeness and politeness. I think oh, it's a yeah. really interesting yeah. case study because it was written in the 1940s, yes. but set in the 18th century and adapted in 2013 and 14. Right. Um, 
Yeah, and what you do it in, so what does it set in? It is set in seventeen seventies, I think. Um, somebody, someone will know that for sure. But I think it's and that you see that's quite interesting because you, they're taking some of the the those, those um, ingredients of aristocratic vice. So you've got the gambling, and yeah. you've got the um, um, I suppose the hubris. Mm. Um, that is associated with yeah. with um, that kind of Chesterfield. It, is, it must be it? this, yeah. It must be this seventeen seventies eighties. He yes. just got back from the American War of yes, Independence because exactly. they all thought he was dead at the start. Yeah, right. And then Outlander, uh, which I've actually only just started watching this week. Have you seen oh, this one? I haven't seen it. No. This is another. So this is about a woman from the nineteen twenties or or thirties or forties, early twentieth century. It's a time travel. Who travel. goes back in time right, right. to the Jacobite Risings in Scotland in the seventeen forties. Oh wow! Um, so she's Does having it... to navigate. So she, she goes there with her early 20th century sense sensibilities, of her yeah. and her sensibilities and finds herself in a, actually quite a, 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 an unusual context mm. and having to deal with 18th century Scotland yes. um, with an wow. English accent. So, right. um, so that's, that's an interesting one again. But, the, but definitely both of those texts seem fascinated with, with playing with <coughs> that. that well, both, yeah, both in a fish out of water again, I suppose, aren't mm. they? They're both interested in testing and interrogating systems of blindness in the past. A great <coughs> um, Well, we're coming up to the last few minutes. <coughs> so, uh, well, there's one more question here. I think this might have to be our last question from Chris Blackburn. And it's, uh, would you know, how are the typical prints of the day like Gilray and Rollinson or works like Hogarth's Manager Mode received by the class that they were lampooning? Um, well, again, I think Joe Bray is a good, will be a good person to ask about this. Uh, when he comes up in the course, because he, he's really interested in these historical prints. But Hogarth um, was was hugely popular. Um, I think it's one of those instances where people enjoyed uh, laughing at themselves. There's a there's a really good book about this actually called by Victor Trail called um, City of Laughter, which actually looks at that and and actually looks at how if you can laugh at yourself, then you sort of claimed ownership of the thing that's being lampooned. So um, so Hogarth was very popular. And also, I think Hogarth's influence on literature is not to be understated. He was great friends with Henry Fielding, so a lot of those satirical novels, I think, there was there was a chain way of influence um, going both ways. Um, but if you haven't seen, I mean, I'm assuming that many of you will have seen these prints, even if you don't know it. But I think it's definitely worth looking up some of these some of these prints um, and some of these series as well. Hogarth's a really good one. Um, Rowlandson is is a good example as well. Um, but I think we are coming to time, so um, I think uh, if there's, I'll just check to see if there's any more questions. Uh, I think we're pretty much there, so all we need to do is say goodbye. Okay. So um, thanks very much for tuning in, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the course. It is ongoing, and there will be another Hangout um, in week... Um, Five, week five, which is the Gothic and 19th century week. So I uh, hope to see you on there and see you back on the platform. Thanks very much for all of your questions and thanks for listening. Have a good evening. Goodbye.